I spent quite some time recently working on some new features for the IoT T-Stick and just released version 161, so it's time for a closer look. Welcome to the IoT T channel, I'm Hans Tanner. A special welcome to all new subscribers and welcome back to everyone else. I'm happy to see you back here. As always, the new version is available on the GitHub page listed in the description below. To install it on the IoT T-Stick, you download the zip file and extract it on your hard drive. Connect the stick to a USB port of your computer and double-click the batch file line to start the installer. The installer should detect the stick automatically and install the new software on it. If there are other devices connected via USB, it is possible that the installer software does not find the stick and terminates without installing the software. In that case, you can either disconnect the other devices or you can change the batch file to tell the installer to which USB port the stick is connected to. Check the readme file for details about how to do that. You may have noticed that the version number changed from 1.5 something to 1.6 and the current version is 1.6.1. The change from 1.5 to 1.6 indicates that there are some more significant improvements than just the usual bug fixes. And here they are. I added additional functionality to the Vicerottle server to directly support the DCCX command interface. Then there is now full support of locomotive decoder functions F9 to F28, including periodic refreshing of the function status to the DCC track. And there is a new Loconet bridge function, which allows the creation of a wired local Loconet and connect it via Wi-Fi to the main Loconet. These are the changes that are visible and I will show them in this video. Underneath that, hidden inside the stick software, are some changes behind the scenes that allow for even more functionality in the future. Most importantly, I added multi-client capability to the WebSocket interface, which means that IoT stick web pages can now be opened on more than one device at the same time and runtime data is sent out simultaneously to all active instances. Furthermore, I made the Loconet over TCP server accessible via WebSockets. This allows for a web page based throttle in the future and in fact I already have a modified version of the DCCX web throttle that uses Loconet over TCP over WebSox and therefore does not need a USB serial connection. The only problem is that the DCCX web throttle user screen is not written to adjust well to a typical smartphone display size, so I'm not pursuing that path any further for a moment. So that's the behind the scenes changes and now back to the visible new features. First the Vice throttle server. As in previous versions it is activated by clicking the Vice throttle option on the node configuration page. This then activates the Vice throttle tab which brings up the Vice throttle configuration page. At first glance there is not much that has changed. There is still the field to set the port number, in most cases this is 12090. In the options section you can select how the power button should work. On a larger layout it is normally not a good idea to let any user shut down the command station, so my preferred option is toggling between off and idle. This stops all locomotives on the track, but does not shut down the track power so it does not trigger any block detectors and makes a restart of the layout much simpler. On the next line there are additional list entries. It is now possible to add locomotive addresses that should be included in the roster of a Viceroutle client software, like for example the popular engine driver app. And there is an additional field for sensors which will be listed if the Viceroutle software supports displaying input statuses. Now, if you are a user of Viceroutle apps like Engine Driver, this sensor option probably raises some questions. Sensors so far 
have not been part of Engine Driver. So why provide such an option? Well, there is a new development over at the DCCX side, a new or extended version of Engine Driver that directly supports the command interface of DCCX. The nice thing about this version is that it offers some new functionality that is not available when using the official Vice Rotal server, which only supports locomotives and turnouts. When using the DCCX protocol, sensor information is communicated to the app and it is also possible to use CV programming, something I think is a real additional value. The new IoT T-Stick Vice Rotal server supports both protocols on either Loconet or on the DCCX stack and automatically detects what communication protocol the client wants to use. So this gives a total of four ways how an app, like the new engine driver, can connect to the Y server. The stick can be connected to an Arduino stack running DCCX, either via Red Hat in case of a wired Loconet, or via the DCC AUX shield when using Wi-Fi only. And in both situations, the Engine Driver app can communicate using either the native Vice Rotal protocol or the DCCX command interface protocol. Depending on the type of connection and protocol, there are some minor differences that should be considered. When connected to a Loconet system, all commands are converted to the Loconet protocol and sent to the Loconet command station. This is no problem for locomotives, turnouts, sensors and CV programming. What is not supported, on the other hand, is loading turnout lists, locomotive rosters or routes. That is the reason why the Vice Rotal server offers the possibility to define certain items right in the setup screen. When using the native Vice Rotal protocol, you can do everything you are used to when using Vice Rotal assigning and running locomotives and setting turnouts. If you switch the Vice Rotal app to DCCX mode, you can in addition use the CB programming features. And of course you can also run the new X Toolbox app, which you can download and install from the Google Store. Check the DCCX webpage for more information about that new app. If the IoT stick is connected to a DCCX command station, you will have an additional option on the configuration page. You now can choose to either use the turnout and locomotive lists from the configuration screen or to load them from DCCX. So if you define turnouts, routes, automations or locomotives in the X-Rail setup as shown in the last video, they will be loaded into the Engine Driver app when it connects to the Vice Rotal server. This is the case independent whether you use the Vice Rotal or the DCCX communication protocol. Also in this case, when using the native Vice Rotal communication, all messages are internally converted to Loconet and then sent to DCCX. What this means is that they are treated the same way like messages that come from a handheld throttle and all devices together basically form just one single integrated Loconet network with DCCX as DCC track signal generator. On the other hand, when using the DCCX communication protocol while the stick is connected to the DCCX command station, messages are no longer converted to Loconet but use a bypass mechanism and a direct communication link between engine driver and DCCX is established. The advantage of this is that special DCCX commands like loading and executing routes that are defined in X-Rail is working as well. Routes are displayed in Engine Driver and can be triggered using the route buttons instead of going through the hoops of using a switch address to trigger them as shown in the last video. The only exception from that direct link between Engine Driver and DCCX is that you still can choose between loading the turnout and roster lists either from the Vice Server setup or from the DCCX command station. If you choose to use the data from the stick setup, 
The commands to load the lists from DCCX are intercepted and the setup data from the configuration screen is used instead. So you have options and the best is the two communication protocols are not exclusive. You can connect one smartphone using DCCX format and another one the native Wisrotl protocol. And if you wish to do so, a third one running the X toolbox. Whatever you like, the IoT stick Wisrotl server will automatically detect what protocol the client you connect to is using and treat it accordingly. The second major new feature is full support of locomotive functions F9 to F28. These higher functions are a little bit of a problem, particularly on older command stations like my Digitrax DCS100. The reason is that they are not defined in Loconet. The original implementation of Loconet only supported F1 through F8. In later versions, support for F9 to F12 was added. Now, there was always the possibility to activate these functions by sending DCC packets over Loconet. But the problem with this approach is that these commands were not added to the refresh buffer of the command station. So in case the track contact of the locomotive is interrupted for a moment and the decoder resets, the information is lost. The new feature which is activated on the node configuration page by checking the refresh F9 to F28 checkbox solves that problem and here is how it works. The stick is monitoring the Loconet traffic for DCC commands for these higher functions. If one is detected it updates the function status for this particular locomotive and adds the information to a timer. This timer then sends out refresh commands to the command station so that the decoder is periodically updated with the complete function information. You can see how it works when watching the Loconet monitor. When I send a command for example from Weisrottl to activate function F23 of Loco25, the Loconet viewer shows the DCC packet that gets sent to the track. The DCC command controls eight functions, F21 to F28 in that case, in the same function group. So what we see is bit 2 set which gives the value of 4. As soon as the function is active, the refresh loop kicks in and keeps sending that command to the track. In this example, only one refresh command is active. But if I activate another function of a different locomotive or a different function group of the same loco, a second refresh command gets added. Of course, this increases the Loconet traffic if there are many active functions. So I made the refresh rate adaptive. If there is only one function to be updated, it will be done about every two seconds. If there are many active functions at the same time, the refresh loop is limited to 10 messages per second. And of course, if all functions in a function group are off, the refresh of that group is no longer needed and stops to avoid unnecessary traffic. If you have several IoT sticks in your network and you want to use this feature, you just have to activate it on one of the sticks. Which one does not matter. It will then take care of the function refresh problem for the entire network. The third new feature I want to show here is the Loconet subnet function. This feature allows you to connect wirelessly to a remote Loconet and then feed the information back into a wired Loconet. I have covered the techniques for that back in video 75 and 76. At the time I implemented the functionality using separate tools like Node-RED, but now the feature is available in the IoT stick. To make it work, the command source of the stick must be set to either LB Server Client or Loconet from MQTT. Those are the two methods the stick supports to receive Loconet commands via Wi-Fi. You then activate the Loconet subnet function checkbox in the communication server section of the node configuration page. Then you connect the Loconet interface to the IoT stick and power it with a 12V DC supply.
This is needed as the interface acts as local loconet master and therefore needs to provide the power for the loconet signal. Now you can connect any loconet device to the loconet side of the interface. In this example I am connecting a DS64 switch decoder. Note that I do not connect track power, so the only way for the DS64 to receive turnout commands is via loconet. Now, when I issue a turnout command for turnouts 1 through 4, the address range the DS64 is set to by default, I see the stat LED briefly blinking, indicating that the command has been received. And if I connect a button to one of the input lines of the DS64, it triggers either a block detector or a turnout message, depending on the DS64 settings. In both cases, I can see the commands in the Loconet viewer connected to the command station. So, the function bridges from one wired Loconet into a local wired subnet via Wi-Fi or MQTT, so it allows to extend your physical network around the globe, if you want. Of course, depending on the distance and the used network method, there may be a little bit of a time lag. So, running a physical throttle with relatively tight timing restrictions from the local subnet is not recommended. I had some success with it, but it is not really reliable. On the other hand, it works great for extending typical output and input functions like turnouts and buttons or block detectors. The other limitation is that the interface only can bridge the loconet signal, but not the DCC track signal. But you can always use a universal panel to bring the DCC information back to the local loconet cable. And that's it for this video. I hope this information was useful or at least interesting for you, and you have a better understanding of the new IoTT stick features and are motivated to try them for yourself. If so, please click the like button below to let me know, or let others know about your experiences in the comment section of this video. And if you are interested in this kind of content, do not forget to subscribe to the IOTT channel and click the bell icon, so you will always be among the first to know when a new video hits the tube. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.